If you have a resolution to brew better beer in 2018, here's how to make good on that goal. Pick up the new edition of John Palmer's essential book, How to Brew. The fourth edition, available in paperback and enhanced ebook format, is a 600 page reference guide that can help brewers of all skill levels. Every chapter has been updated and expanded, and there are five totally new chapters covering malting and brewing, strong beers, fruit beers, sour beers, and adjusting water for style. What's more, the new edition has revised and updated information on managing your fermentation. Grab your copy of How to Brew at brewerspublications.com. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, January 11th, 2018. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, home brewer Brock Masters shares his experiment in brewing a non-alcoholic homebrew for a friend who can't drink alcohol. Did Brock brew a non-alcoholic beer? And was the beer he brewed delicious? Stay tuned. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows, our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other Basic Brewing gear. And we got stickers now. If you buy something on the shop, you get a free uh, Basic Brewing sticker to stick on your uh, kegerator or whatever you stick stickers on. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Basic Brewing and find our show page on Facebook. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you'd uh, do us the favor of rating us on iTunes and maybe leaving a nice comment, that'll help new listeners find us. And if you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Steve Wilkes and I shot three videos uh, earlier this week, two for Basic Brewing Video and one for his shop's channel on YouTube. That video is already out there. Uh, if you search for Steve's Brew Shop on YouTube, you can see the second part of a two-part series that we shot on making a sizer. It's a sizer that Steve started on camera right on my kitchen counter. You can see the whole uh, process on that earlier episode of him starting the sizer and getting it into the fermenter. Um, after racking onto apples and flavoring with ginger, the sizer is now ready to taste. And, big surprise, it was delicious. <laughs> Uh, I also posted a link uh, to that video on our uh, Basic Brewing uh, Facebook page, so you can find it there as well. Uh, the first of the uh, Basic Brewing video episodes that we shot is about my Lemon Drop Golden Ale. It's a, a very tasty Belgian-inspired beer that I did a, a hop stand uh, to flavor with uh, Lemon Drop hops. and just all about the hop stands uh, nowadays. I'm, I'm planning to post that one on Monday for the general public, but our uh, financial supporters uh, at the $5 level on uh, Patreon will see it uh, a few days earlier. Uh, and uh, I'll also post the recipe on the pa Patreon site uh, for uh, all supporters, uh, or um, uh, supporters of all levels, rather. Uh, and thanks to everybody who has uh, been kicking in on uh, the Patreon thingy. Um, I'm still obsessing about my Instant Pot my wife got me one for Christmas. Uh, I talked about it last week, and uh, Nathaniel, uh, Nathaniel Synth from uh, Lightheart Brewing Company uh, up in Vancouver that uh, you heard on this show uh, wrote to me. Uh, he says, uh, I first just wanted to thank you for spending your American money on the Canadian peso. <laughs> he says the Instant Pot is from a Canadian company. I've been a, quote, pothead for almost three years and, and still... Mine, uh, at least once a week, often more than three times a week, Nathaniel says. Often we throw some meat and a malty beer in our Instant Pot for Taco Meat Thursdays. Mmm, that sounds good. Such tender, tasty meat. Uh, I've also used it for lacto starters before, to great success, especially using lacto plantarum health supplement pills. So uh, thanks, Nathaniel. I, I mentioned last week that I wanted to use the yogurt function of my Instant Pot to do some wort souring, and it sounds like uh, that's essentially what Nathaniel's doing there with his uh, lacto starters. Uh, I'm hoping to get ingredients this week to do my own experiment. Uh, in the meantime, I'm spending way too much time watching Instant Pot videos on YouTube, uh, and a couple of words of advice for people who are making cooking videos. Those words are microphone and and or tripod. <laughs> Seems like there are two camps 
to most cooking videos. Those shot well that sound like they were recorded in a gym shower room and those that sound good but make me seasick because they're shot with a phone while the f- with one hand while the food prep is being done with the other hand. It's a shame because there's a lot of good content in the videos, but you know, the production is distracting. Enough of my old man snarky video production comments. Uh, how did I, how did I go off on that? I don't know. In in my day, we shot with tube cameras that weighed twenty five pounds and recorded on separate decks that weighed more than that. And the video was grainy when it was dark, and you got streaks of light when the headlights went by. But we liked it. <laughs> we edited it on tape, not computers. <laughs> if we wanted to go live somewhere, we had to have a giant truck. <laughs> uh from uh, old, outdated technology, let's shift to uh, talking about stuff that works, like uh, electric brewing gear from our sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. I saw a tweet from listener Jim out there on the East Coast who said, started brewing at 8.30, it's now 11.10. Electric brew in a bag, home brew inside, rocks. High Gravity system is so awesome. Jim says, saw these way back in Philly, seeing you guys, meaning us, Use them pushed me over the edge. Uh, two friends have since purchased as well. Well, glad to hear Jim is enjoying his high gravity system, and uh, I sure like my electric brew in a bag system with the Werthog controller. Makes it super easy to control mash temps, boil levels, and even do precise hop stands. And uh, you'll see my system on the next uh, basic brewing video uh, with the Golden Ale. Uh, high gravity has a wide range of turnkey electric systems. From your basic brew in a bag systems to, uh, you know, multi-vessel systems uh, and many different controllers at HighGravityBrew.com. You can find them there. And uh, Desiree says the offer code EBC75BB is still active. You can use that code to get $75 off your electric gear purchase. EBC75BB at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. They take the pain out of propane. Okay, often I get email asking how to make non-alcoholic homebrew. And there are many reasons why someone would need to remove alcohol from their diet, but it would be great if there was a way to keep delicious beer in the diet. Well, Brock Masters took on the challenge for a friend, and he sent us a couple of cans of his experimental brew to taste and to talk about. Brock Masters, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Hi, James. Thanks for having me on the show today. You're you're calling in from from chilly Chicago, uh, and we're talking about the, a delicious beer that you made. Uh, before I want to get into that, uh, let's talk about your brewing background. How long you've been brewing, and what do you like to brew? Yeah, so I've I've been brewing now for about three and a half years, and it, it all started about four years ago. Uh, my wife and I were moving to Chicago. Uh, from Toronto, Canada, and my brother had a couple of glass carboys that had been sitting on his front porch for probably three years, and he had had them for decoration. And so he was moving, and he said, hey, you want to take these with you? So they sat in my garage probably for about the better part of a year and a half, and a coworker of mine, her husband, was making hard cider. And so I was kind of interested, and I said, hey, what's that all about? And she said, oh, it's really easy. You get some fresh-pressed cider, add some yeast, and in two months you got something great to drink. So I dove in full force, bought myself five and a half gallons of of cider and made my first batch, and it turned out spectacularly. So that was kind of the introduction to to the fermenting and brewing world. Uh, From there, I got myself involved in doing some um, uh, extract brewing and very quickly got myself into the all-grain world. So within a year, I went from doing five-gallon batches to owning a a uh, half barrel brewery. Wow. And uh you have sent in a, a your experiment in making a non-alcoholic beer and I've made some very extremely low gravity beers uh, before and one question that I get a lot is why. <laughs> People say why bother, you know, making a beer with such, you know, low alcohol? Why did you want to to make a non-alcoholic homebrew? So as I mentioned, I've been brewing for a few years now, and I started making some really nice big beers. Uh, my wife's from the Czech Republic, so I started making some nice Czech-style lagers, uh, doing pilsners, 
I love IPAs myself. Uh, I'm a big stout nut, so we do all sorts of uh, Irish stouts here at the house. And a good friend of mine uh, is going through a medical treatment and unfortunately is not able to have any alcohol uh, because of the medication they're on. And so one of the things that was said to me was, you know, I'm really going to miss those real big hoppy beers. All that's available in the supermarket are these kind of lager style beers. They're really on the malty side. They don't have any big flavor. And so I kind of took this upon myself as an opportunity to try something new and try and come through for them. Yeah, and I've, and I've received uh questions about this periodically. I mean, people really are interested in how to make a non-alcoholic uh, beer uh, because the I've tasted some non-alcoholic commercial beers uh, and they're not, you know, it's not, they're not so good, really. Yeah, they, they, they tend to have a real kind of coy sweetness left over. Um, they, they don't have any kind of particular effervescence or wonderfulness to them. So this, I thought, was a great opportunity to try something new. So what I did was, of course, get on the uh, get on the Google machine and start looking into this. <laughs> There's a number of articles out there. Uh, the Facebook forums were really helpful. And everything I found kind of led down to this opportunity to make basically a full-bodied beer and then boil it. Uh, some of the big concerns there were ending up with a product that was far too bitter. So that kind of prompted me to think, okay, if I'm going to build this recipe, I should dial back the initial bittering hop and then look where I can get flavor in at the back side of the recipe. The other part of it too was I had read you get a lot of these cardboard flavors and a lot of that flavor was coming from oxidation. People were brewing their beer, then transferring it back into the boil kettle and heating it up. And by doing so, you were introducing oxygen. So I really wanted to try and come up with a process that would keep the oxygen from ever touching the product. And I guess the basic theory behind these processes that people use is that the boiling point for alcohol is lower than the boiling point for water. So in theory, and I think it's what, 170 degrees Fahrenheit? Yeah, it's one, 173.5 is the is the boiling point for ethyl alcohol. And you probably know, being from Canada, you probably know the metric. Funny, funny enough, uh, Canada's a weird place. A number of things are in kilograms and a number of things are in Celsius, but your home thermometer's in Fahrenheit. So <laughs> when we when we move down here, you know, I know that 21 Celsius outside's a nice day, but 72 in the house is great. I don't know why it is. It's just, it is what it is. So so I think, you see, as you say, 173, I'm looking at my little chart here, my little cheater chart. This would be like 78, something like that, 77, 78. Again, I'll, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> if people are screaming at their podcast devices. Uh, so, so yeah, the, I guess the general theory is that you, you brew the beer, you ferment the beer, uh, and then you reheat it uh, to the boiling point of the ethanol. And then the ethanol leaves the beer, and there you have uh, a non non-alcoholic beverage, right? Yeah, so essentially you're doing distillation, and rather than collecting the ethyl alcohol that you've boiled off, you're letting it evaporate into the air and keeping the byproduct that normally a distilling house would throw out. And so, how did you how did you accomplish this? So, as I mentioned, I had, I had done a lot of research, and my big fear was getting that, that cardboard flavor or that oxidation, oxidation in the product. So, I took it upon myself. Uh, my, my setup here at the house is a, a three-vessel three system, uh, all 20-gallon uh, vessels, and my first two are electric, and then my boil kettle is um, propane. So, what I was able to do was actually take uh, the keg of beer and submerge it in my electric hot liquor tank and then with my electric controller dial in the temperature that I wanted that uh, surrounding water to be at. Now I, I will give a plug for a product out there called Tilt. It's a, a Bluetooth hydrometer that measure, measures temperature as well as uh, specific gravity. This product, what's really cool about it is it's got a pretty wide range in terms of uh, temperature. So you can actually have it go up to almost 190 Fahrenheit and it will still read out to your Bluetooth device, your iPhone or Android phone. Hmm. So I was able to actually put the keg of finished beer in the electric uh, hot liquor tank, drive up the temperature around the keg and monitor the internal temperature of the beer. Once I got the beer up around 170, I dialed back the surrounding water and was able to stabilize the keg at around 175 Fahrenheit. At that point, I used my ball lock on the gas port and started burping off the alcohol vapor. 
And could you actually smell the alcohol coming off? Oh, absolutely. It, it smelled like a it smelled like a like a whiskey barn. It was unbelievable. Um, the beer initially, when it went in there, was uh, at six point five percent alcohol. So as it was coming off, there was a quite a strong uh, aroma in the in the garage. <laughs> And you probably want to keep you don't want, you don't want to smoke around the. Uh... <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> now there are some people out there that probably think that you should have uh, hooked up a uh, you know a copper coil to the output of your. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there 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 might be a way to get around that no distillation law in, here in America. You're, no officer, I'm making non-alcoholic beer. I'm not trying to make whiskey, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm collecting fuel for my vehicle. <laughs> So how how long did you uh, did you boil? So once once the keg got up to 175 Fahrenheit, uh, I held it there for roughly 45 to to 50 minutes, thinking that was probably and again that's from everything I read long enough to boil off the alcohol. Uh, I think next time when I do it, because uh, there was eventually it was found out that there was some residual alcohol in the beer that I would probably hold it there for a little bit longer, knowing that I'm not doing any harm to the beer and that I'm not heating it up to the point where the beer itself was evaporating. Yeah, we don't we don't want to get too far into spoilers here, Brock, but <laughs> uh so did you were you able to did the smell of the alcohol diminish over time? Yeah, abs- absolutely. As as time went on and again we, you know, have uh good ventilation, the the smell of alcohol essentially became nil. So there was no no remaining odor uh surrounding surrounding that keg that we had been burping off. Now, one would think that uh, that you might be burping off some hop character as well if you're if you're heating up your your finished beer uh, for a second time. Yeah, that's that's a great point, and so I was concerned about that too. And as I mentioned, I, I did quite a low hopping at the beginning. I had used only uh, 0.35 ounces of mosaic as my initial uh, bittering hop, and then when we cooled the beer in the whirlpool, I threw in an ounce of uh, Cascade. So after the sort of boiling off of the alcohol had been completed and the beer was still warm around that 173 Fahrenheit point, I actually force transferred it into a nether keg that had four ounces of hops in it. So two ounces of citra and two ounces of cascade and hop bags. So I kind of almost did a, a, a whirlpool temperature steep of the beer. Then as the beer cooled because it was cold outside, I hooked it up to CO2 uh, and just allowed it essentially to cool on gas in yep. a closed environment. It sounded like you did a hop stand essentially. Yep, yep, exactly. I did a I did a secondary hop stand after the beer had been fermented. And you you pressure carbonated it. Uh, if one were to want to uh, want to bottle condition this beer, you would have to uh, add yeast back in after it was chilled. Uh, and and the priming sugar as well, uh, but it's a whole lot Correct. easier so, just to pressure uh, carb. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm in a, a the fortunate situation where I where I have that equipment here at the house. But if someone was interested in doing this, and then bottle conditioning, they would certainly uh, need to reintroduce uh, some uh, some sugar either through sugar droplets or sugar tabs, and then some form of additional yeast to ensure that the the critters had something to eat. And then uh, essentially, you would be adding a little bit more alcohol in to the beer at that point uh, because of the re-fermentation in the bottle. But, you know, it has to be minimal at that point. Yeah, and I know I know our local homebrew shop offers a lot of uh, home homemade soda kits to make things like sarsaparilla root beer. And the way those are carbonated is by introducing a little bit of yeast and sugar at the end. And from what I've told, it introduces very minimal uh, alcohol, and those are, are safe for kids to drink. So I couldn't see it introducing enough that would create any kind of concern about uh, having any blood alcohol level. Sure. Um, now, you, is there anything, any other details about the process uh, that we should know? I think, I think the biggest thing was just, again, managing sanitation, making sure that uh, we were really good with chilling, making sure after the beer was fermented that we were, again, really concerned about sanitation in terms of transferring and then uh, this opportunity to bring the beer up to 175 plus degrees to ensure that we were uh, boiling off the uh, ethyl alcohol. 
Yeah, I think I think, and I think that your your point of not transferring the beer uh, from from the keg into the kettle again, you know, you risk you're you're limiting uh, the risk of oxidation. I think that was very smart. Um, you know, and you're essentially. I've 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 had a couple of beers in my time that had oxidized some home brews, and and they really do have an off-putting flavor. So, my my big goal in this whole process was to make something that still had that fresh, hop forward character, while providing a you know a, a booze free <laughs> experience. So, you you actually canned these beers. How did how did you can them? Yeah, so that's that's kind of a fun story. I'd been looking into getting a canning machine myself, and for any of your listeners who's ever looked into it, they're they're not a, a cheap uh, investment. It's a couple grand to get you started. And so I, I was up at my local homebrew shop uh, in Libertyville, Illinois, and I was showing the gentleman there uh, the website for this canning machine, and he said to me, oh, wow, I should maybe get one for my shop. And I said, yes, that's a great idea. <laughs> so our... So our local homebrew shop for $30 provides uh, the canning machine, the cans, and essentially they'll come back and help you can up all your product. Uh, It's a great service. It's a lot of fun, and uh, I love doing it. The great thing about cans is they cost maybe 20 to 30 cents depending on the volume you're canning. And if you're giving beer away or sending it to friends, you know you're not going to get that container back. So it's, it's worth the sacrificial nickel or to 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 can up your product and give that to your your loved ones. There's a, there's a cool factor to cans as well. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's no doubt that there's a cool factor with uh, with canning your beer. Uh, it gives it a real craft beer feel. Something that people go to their local uh, brew pubs and pick up and bring home. So it's always fun to be able to can something up, give it to friends and family. The other great thing too is that cans are rel- relatively inexpensive. So you're not getting those bottles back that you've invested a piece and there's no hardship giving out cans and seeing them get crushed and thrown in the recycling bin okay now uh we uh steve and i you sent two cans and steve and i uh went to or i went to steve's shop uh to taste and uh i also brought a a surprise device along so <laughs> so let's let's uh hear how it uh, the tasting turned out great Steve Wilkes, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio, and welcome to 2018. Thanks, James. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, we got a, uh, a homebrew here from Brock Masters, which, you know, sounds like he ought to be a secret agent of Brock Masters. That's the manliest name I think I've ever, uh, uh, ever since Mitch Steele. <laughs> Mitch Steele's pretty manly, but Brock Masters, yeah. I think he might have him there. I'm, I'm pretty sure he does. <laughs> I, I even canned his homebrew. Yeah. I mean, that's like the most impressive thing I've ever seen. You're like, you're pouring this, going, it's a homebrew, and ksh, yeah. really? Yeah. Try to wash that and reuse it. Yeah. <laughs> so we're tasting here a beer. I haven't told you anything about it other than it is a homebrew. So what are your what are your first impressions? All right, Pilgrim. <laughs> oh, wait, that's my John Wayne. It's not very good. Uh, it's very piney, grapefruity, citrusy. Uh, I don't get any big bittering hop from it. It's not very bitter. Mm-hmm. Um, it's nicely balanced. It's a little sweet, but in a good way. It's not gloppy sweet or under attenuated sweet. It's just kind of a somewhat Swedish Swedish beer. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the meatballs that gave it away. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, Dane. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> Um, it's uh, it's very nice. It's uh, some kind of an APA, I would say. Um, it's not clear. I mean, it's it's a little bit hazy, but again, not in a bad way. Uh, pretty good head retention, even in our plastic cups. Nicely carbonated. Um, I give it a seven. It's easy to dance to. <laughs> it's got a good beat. Yeah, I think it's really tasty. I think um, it's it's got a nice clean finish. It's got lots of hop flavor. Uh, and aroma. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not high on bitterness. Um, it's got a f- fairly substantial mouthfeel. The carbonation could be a little bit more, but I think he keg he keg filled the can, oh, so right. that that uh, uh, may have something to do with it. But but it was quite fizzy coming out of the uh, the can, and the head holds well. It throws off uh, the finish has a pretty strong peach to apricot flavor. It kind of throws off some stone fruit in that way. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's nice. 
Would you, is there any reason why you wouldn't drink this beer? Would you ding it for any, is it missing anything? No, it's not missing anything in my opinion. I think it's a nice session beer. Um, I I can't tell what the alcohol is in it, but I don't think it's very strong. I think it's in the, in the 5% range, 45 to 5.5% range. Um, I think it's a nice session West Coast APA. Mm-hmm. Now, I'll probably get slammed because it's supposed to be East Coast, but it's but it's got a lot of that grapefruit and kind of West Coasty hopness to it. It's not very bitter. I think it's really an, a, a nice American session ale. That's why I would call it. What if I were to tell you that this is a no alcohol homebrew? I wouldn't believe you. <laughs> really? Now, Brock, and we'll go over the uh, the the technique that he used to take the alcohol out uh, before this our little chat, and I'll and I'll let you in afterwards. But he uh, essentially evaporated the alcohol out of the beer, or at least he says he did. Now, I've got a little trick here, if you want to hold my microphone. <laughs> okay, but, but we're still just dating. <laughs> I have here. You have to point it to me. Oh, yeah. I have oh, here. <laughs> I won't go there. Larry, Bed, Larry Bud Melman. Okay, I have here a blood alcohol ah. meter. Okay. Now, uh, now, and you're supposed to wait 15 minutes before you... you you take the test because uh, to get an accurate uh, reading. Because if you drink, you'll it'll be more. So uh, I haven't had anything to drink today, and I took my blood alcohol uh, before I left the house, and I'm going to drink a little more, and then I'm going to do the BAC. And if there's any alcohol in it, it should register. Right. <clears throat> Counting down from ten. This is a BAC track meter. Five, four, three, two. All right. Drum roll, please. And it says... Still thinking. Survey says... Still thinking. Wow. This is the longest I think I've ever seen it think. They can't figure it out. Oh. 0.07. 0.07. So, there actually is alcohol in the non-alcoholic homebrew. <laughs> Seven-tenths of one percent. Is that right? Well, that's, well 0.08 is, is, the, is, in Arkansas at least, is, the, is your drunk. But I'm, oh. I'm sure. I'm sure if I waited 15 minutes, it would go down, because I'm just. I still have alcohol residue in my mouth, right, and I'm right, blowing right. it out. But that says that there is there is actually alcohol in the in the beverage. So well, I feel a little vindicated there, <laughs> but there can't be much. Yeah. So what? So what we may want to do is wait 15 minutes and take it again and see uh, see. What it is actually, and what we may want to do is compare it with like maybe later on i'll I'll do like a standard pale ale or whatever, and take a reading doing the same thing, mm-hmm. and we'll see if it is reduced if the alcohol is reduced, but there is according to this meter there is some there's some in there well, button my britches and <laughs> I'll butter your necktie. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed um, <clears throat> because I, I was hoping that uh, you know I tried I tried to uh, boil the alcohol uh, out of a home brew and it turned out nasty. Um, now I didn't do any of the uh, the dry hopping or I didn't do any of the you know playing with the hops afterwards and it was just you know I boiled it and then I bottled it and I pressurized it. So uh, and there was no alcohol in that, but it was nasty. So I was hoping that Brock had had found the the trick. Well, me too. I mean, <laughs> I so I don't know what to say. It, it it's a it's a really nice beer. I'd drink this a lot. And uh, 
I had in the a couple of three years ago. I'm kind of stammering, maybe because I'm drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but but a few years ago, I I got interested in brewing a non-alcoholic beer, actually for a friend of mine who was going through some health issues and he couldn't drink beer anymore. So I thought, well, I can maybe take this challenge up, which I never did. But I read a lot of recipes for it, and everything that I got back in the literature was, don't even try. Mm. It's kind of like, eh, you know, people were boiling the alcohol off. Um, really, the closest to it that I've ever seen that was successful are those extremely low alcoholic beers that you brewed with 100% rye, mm. um, the little one and a half two percent porters that you've made with a lot of crystal malt. So I'm not sure what Brock did. Exactly, but um, it's really good. Yeah, yeah, it tastes good. Uh, I would say um, he's on the right track as far as flavor is concerned. Uh, we just got to figure out, and I don't know. I don't, I don't know of any test that you can do to a beer to see if there's any alcohol in it besides this, besides drinking it and blowing it into the thing. And so, anyway, so it's a tasty beer, uh, but I think that uh, I think that it it, it it failed the failed the BAC test. Yeah, because I think you would have no, you wouldn't have gotten a DUI, right? At point oh seven, you would not have gotten a DUI. I guess, yeah, but it, yeah, <laughs> but I'm, but I'm sure, and I think even you know we've been sitting here talking for you know a couple minutes afterwards to see if it if it went down. This is counting down from a thirteen. This is riveting radio. Well, I'll say how's how's two thousand eighteen treating you? Uh, so far, like I'm a pork chop around a pack of wild dogs. <laughs> it's a dog eat dog world, and I'm wearing milk bone underwear. That's right. And you just called all the dogs. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, the, yeah, the thing also is a silent dog whistle. <laughs> It's called State Troopers, is what it calls. It. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and my wife is here uh, uh, driving, by the way. Not at the. Oh, oh, now it says zero. Zero. Now it says zero. Huh. So. Uh, hmm. Let's think about that. So maybe there's there's a trace amount of alcohol in there, but not enough to. To affect my and I've only had just you know quarter of a yeah, beer two or three ounces most but now it's back down to zero well that, so maybe maybe it yeah. has just enough to register fresh mm -hmm. like like non-alcoholic beers have the definition is l less than half a percent of alcohol right. so even the na beers have half, half a percent of alcohol wow so maybe We'll do. We'll try this again in a couple minutes. But maybe, maybe Brock is onto something. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm really. You know, when I first drank it, I'm just stammering around here because it tastes like a really nice little session beer. Uh, so I was right in saying it wasn't very strong, obviously. But, but I would never have guessed it was non-alcoholic. And I just took. I just realized I just took another sip. So I'm gonna have to wait another 15 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> um, but uh, but we can do that later. Yeah. Um, I might as well just finish this because this is really tasty. It's very good beer. I mean, I like it a lot. Wow. So the taste test. Uh, I'm gonna have to experiment more, more with the uh, the alcohol part, but the taste test it passed. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, it gets a A plus. I mean, it's it's really a tasty beer. All right. Thanks, Steve. Thank you, James. Sir, first of all, Brock, are you a secret agent? No, no, I'm not. <laughs> and if you were, you couldn't tell me. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> okay, so uh, so we were we were both uh, you and I were 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 surprised at the at the results. Uh, I have to say that uh, that after we finished the tasting, uh, fifteen minutes later, I came back and did uh, another BAC. Uh, uh, test and it measure, measured zero uh, okay so so what I did was I, I I decided to do some some further testing uh, with other other beers in the name of science in the name of science so I I did uh, on separate days uh, I started you know at uh, around the same time of day uh, and I drank a whole beer in around five minutes. Um, and then I took a, a BAC reading right away, 
and then I waited 15 minutes and did another reading. So, so here's here's how it went. Okay. Uh, your homebrew uh, drank the whole thing in five minutes. Immediately took a reading. It measured 0 0.114 on the BAC meter, and then after 15 minutes, it measured 0 0.17. So, uh, so how did it measure up to other beers? I, I tested a, on a Bell's Too Hearted Ale, uh, which is, I think, the, the favorite uh, beer in the country right now. After, four mi or, or after uh, drinking the beer in about five minutes, uh, it measured 0 0.135, and after 15 minutes, 0 0.022. So that compares with yours at 11 or uh, 0.114 and 0 0.017. I did an O'Doul's. <laughs> I sacrificed for the science. <laughs> I did You're an a good man, James. <laughs> <laughs> I did an O'Doul's, uh, literally the soda pop of beers. Uh, I drank the whole thing, and it measured 0 0.000, which surprised me. And then after 15 minutes, 0 0.000. And then you suggested that I do one of my uh, rye-based low-alcohol beers. So I did my Scoby Soured uh, homebrew, which I figure has an alcohol level of around 1%. Af after five minutes of chugging that beer, uh, it measured uh, – the BAC measured 0 0.030. And after f 15 minutes, there was nothing, 0 0.000. So uh, – in, 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 the, your beer initially uh, measured what did you say six and a half percent alcohol? Yeah. So after after taking the hydrometer readings and the beer finishing out at uh, ten ten, we calculated we were at uh, six point five percent. So the be Bell's Too Hearted is seven percent. So they're they're very they're close. So thinking about those readings, it looks like you you did reduce the alcohol, but maybe not as much as you thought. Yeah. And, you know, when I found this out after we had spoken, there was obviously some initial kind of feelings of being a little bummed out. And I kind of took a step back and I said, you know what? The beer still tasted great. And I think that's an important factor for the listeners. This was an opportunity to try something new, something I had never done before. And what it didn't do was ruin the taste of the final product. So, I'm able to look at this and say, okay, the process did eliminate some alcohol from the brew. Uh, perhaps the next time when I try this, I'll be able to either bring the temperature up a little bit higher or take that process of keeping the beer held at about 175 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for maybe an initial 30, 40, maybe even 50 minutes. But the most important thing was no, no, no oxygen was introduced and the final product still tasted delicious. It was it was very good, uh, and I I drank the whole. I felt a little bad chugging that <laughs> chugging that beer in such a, a fast amount of time because it was a delicious beer. Uh, it, as we said in the thing, uh, you know, we it was pe kind of peachy and and uh, there was a little bit of uh, maybe a mango flavor as well, and you know, a lot of grapefruit. Um, so it, it was a, a delicious beer. Um, now, remind me how long you did you did the boiling process uh, this first time. Yeah, so we, we the beer was brought up to 175 Fahrenheit, and it was held there for 45 minutes. And so it seems that that probably reduced the alcohol content by a few points. So I think if I do it again, I might drive the, the beer up to around 180 degrees and try holding it there for maybe 60 to 70 minutes and see if we're able to reduce that, that alcohol content further. Yeah, I think I think you're on the right track. Um, you know, the most important thing is it's a it's a delicious beer, uh, and then you know I guess the science is working. If you can smell the alcohol coming out of the you know the output there, it's it's leaving the beer. It's just a question of how long it's going to take uh, to get rid of it. So so moving forward, when I try this again, I think we'll look at heating the beer up a little higher and maybe carrying on the distillation process, if you will, for a longer period of time. The The other thing that came to mind after going online and looking for some means of testing alcohol, I checked eBay and I checked on Amazon, and there's actually some strips that can be used for breastfeeding mothers to test if there's alcohol in their breast milk. So I thought we could actually draw some beer off the keg 
while we're going through the process and use these strips to actually test the beer for alcohol content. Huh. I don't know of another way, you know, whether it's taking gravity readings or taking, you know, refractometer readings. You know, I'm, I'm sure that there are chemists or scientists out there who can, you know, maybe enlighten us a little bit on how we can actually check uh, the beer for alcohol. Yeah, I'd, I'd love it if, if any of your listeners out there uh, have an idea or them themselves have a scientific process for checking the actual level of alcohol in a, in a, in a fluid after the fermentation process has been finished. I'd, I'd love to get feedback from them and certainly implement it in, in my process. I don't guess it <laughs> probably wouldn't be safe to, uh, <laughs> to to light the output of the keg. <laughs> and then when, when the fire goes out, the alcohol has gone. <laughs> probably not a good idea. <laughs> no, no, certainly not. I was also wondering, too, if there was maybe a means of, of driving some CO2 into the keg while it's hot through the uh, liquid output port and trying to push some of that residual alcohol that may be in uh, an evaporated state but still trapped in the keg. Yeah, I wonder if there is some condensation, you know, where the alcohol is is driven out of the liquid and then, you know, uh, and then uh, condenses on the inside of the keg and then falls back into the I mean, that's one disadvantage to having kind of a closed system whereas if you had it like in an in a kettle or in an open uh, environment, you know, the the alcohol could more easily escape. Yeah, no, that's true. The 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 one big risk there of course is then the oxidation oxidation factor. Yeah, yeah. And you, there was it was certainly not oxidized. It was nice and fresh, uh, and delicious. So, uh, yeah, I would I would hate to go backwards on that. I did, I tried to do uh, a very small experiment using uh, you know I took a couple of finished beers and I put it in a little pot and I brought it up to the proper temperature and held it there for a while uh, and I didn't do any you know like rehopping or anything like that and I put it into a, a PET bottle, and then I had one of those little, um, the caps with the little, uh, you know, the ball valve, ball yeah, valve the little, on the top little of it. Yeah, the soda fizz caps, those are great. Yeah, and so I re kind of recarbonated it, but man, it was nasty. It was, <laughs> 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 and I did the BAC thing. I don't know if I checked it, you know, right away after drinking it like I did these, but after 15 minutes, there was no alcohol detected. But gosh, it's something you know that I didn't want to drink. It, I think it was oxidized because there was a cardboard flavor, uh, and all the hop character was gone, and it was just nasty. So I didn't I didn't do any more experimentation. So I'm glad that you have done this, you know, to kind of lead us down a better path. One of uh, one of the things I think we'll look into next time as well is there's these new great hop extracts out there, and so I thought about maybe brewing the beer and then fermenting it with absolutely no hops in it and then using some of these different hop extracts that are available to kind of drive that bitterness at the front end and then also drive some of the hoppiness at the back end. Yeah, or maybe the cryo hops as well uh, for to give a lot, a lot of hop, hop flavor in there too. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Brock, this has been fun. Um, you know, we, we talked uh, or we corresponded uh you know, yesterday or day before, and you were you were asking if I wanted to call this off. You know, because uh, you know it didn't it didn't go the way uh, that you you thought it would. But I think that this is great. Uh, I think that we learn more from sort of failed experiments than than our successes. So I appreciate your your coming on and and stick you know hanging in there and and uh, you know and going along with the whole process. Oh, absolutely. I think I think. Uh, I'm sure, as you mentioned, there's other listeners out there who've who've thought about this, maybe wanted to to figure out how they could do it themselves. So, if anybody else uh, has some successes, I, I would love it if you share it on the Basic Brewing Radio Facebook page for all of us to uh, to read and take note of of your opportunities and and your successes, and that way we can all get better as brewers together. Awesome. Yes, the the community of home brewers is strong, and so I'm sure that there there's some answers out there. Well, I appreciate it, Brock. It's it's been a lot of fun, and uh, I hope that you will keep us in the loop on the next attempt. Absolutely, James. I'll make sure that I send you out a couple cans in the next round. Thanks for your time today. Looking forward to it. Well, thanks again to Brock. I consider this experiment to be a success, even though he didn't eliminate the alcohol altogether. He apparently did reduce it. And the, more importantly, I guess, the beer was great. Uh, I look forward to hearing and I hope tasting 
more about further experiments. Hey, if you can help us out on how to measure alcohol in a beer that's been treated like this, uh, drop me a line or comment on the post about this episode on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash basic brewing. Uh, we'd appreciate uh, any expertise that you might have. Maybe somebody who uh, does distilling, you know, maybe if you uh, have experience in that and, you know, want to remain anonymous, <laughs> drop me a line. Uh, if you, in the meantime, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to James at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way, like early releases of Basic Brewing video videos. Check all that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering, and Decoction Mashing and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. You can get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo. And you can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store as well. You can find our log books. You can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all that out at basicbrewingshop.com. And you get a sticker when you <laughs> when you make a purchase at uh, at, at uh, basicbrewingshop.com. You get a sticker. I'm all excited about my new stickers. And don't forget that uh, you can join the American Homebrewers Association uh, and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website, is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voice, and we'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. Mm-hmm.